So I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, the Central University of Himachal Pradesh, the Indian Association of Physics Teachers, Dr. Sharma and Professor Sastri for this opportunity to present an introduction to a quantum impedance model uh, to the online faculty development program. Uh, so the model is, is pretty simple and straightforward. There's just three assumptions, geometry fields and uh, what we call a mass gap. Uh, the geometry is defined with the Clifford algebra. Uh, Clifford algebra is the mathematical language of physics. Most of us uh, know it in the Pauli uh, and, and Dirac matrix representations, where the Pauli matrices are the basis vectors of 3D space in Clifford algebra, and the Dirac matrices are those of 4D space time in the algebra. We want to work in the geometric representation. It's much more intuitive than the matrix representation. And in the geometric representation, the three-dimensional Pauli algebra is one scalar point, three vector line elements, three bivector area elements, and a volume uh, trivector. <clears throat> so this vacuum wave function, then we're right at the foundation of quantum mechanics. We're starting at the bottom and working up, and it's important to get it right at the bottom. Uh, the vacuum wave function is the same at all scales, whether we're looking at the Planck length or the Compton wavelength or the de Broglie wavelength or the boundary of the observable universe. It's, it's the same wave function. To have physical manifestation of the wave function, <coughs> excuse me, we need, uh, we need to have a coupling constant. And we use the electromagnetic coupling constant. So the four fundamental constants that define alpha permit us to assign geometrically and topologically appropriate quantized electric and magnetic quanta to, flux quanta to the eight uh, wave function components. So this, this gives us a physical model. It still requires a scale of space. And for that, we take the lightest charged elementary particle, uh, the electron. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the basic photon-electron interaction. We start with the basic photon-electron interaction of QED. So we can imagine we have an electron that's exciting a, a positron out of the vacuum. <coughs> and uh, the interaction of those two can be modeled by uh, the geometric Clifford product. What comes out of space-time, uh, the geometric product uh, it changes dimensionality. So if we multiply two vectors together, what comes out is a scalar and an area element, a bivector. Uh, and this dimension increasing property that we started with something that was one dimensional vectors and now we've got a, a two dimensional object. If we go ahead and, and include a three dimensional object in the wave function, then what comes out of multiplying two, two wave functions is actually six dimensional phase space. Uh, space-time works if you're not thinking about the relative phases of the three orientational degrees of freedom. But uh, you need uh, independent phases for each of the, the uh, spatial, spatial degrees of freedom. And that comprises the six-dimensional phase space. There's no free parameters in the model. This is it. So keep that in mind, please, if you would, as we go on and, and show what emerges from applying this model to various circumstances. <clears throat> so um, the, the outline, what we're going to do, we're going to define impedance and give a brief history and look at impedance matching. Uh, what matters uh, in physics isn't uh, the impedances themselves, but whether they're matched. They have to be matched for energy to flow, and, and like energy, what matters is the relative values, not their absolute values. Then we'll look at uh, uh, matching to a single free electron and how that relates to the hydrogen atom and mechanical impedances. And this is where it gets pretty interesting because there's topological inversion going on in mechanical impedance. Uh, this uh, uh, particular bit of, of uh, unexpected and, and pretty much unexplored uh, uh, 
aspect of our world that, that we have this inversion in, in mechanical impedance uh, has a lot of consequences in what follows. We'll look at the unstable particle spectrum, the nodes of, of a quantized impedance network, and and the lifetimes of the unstable particles are uh, determined by uh, the uh, phase differences uh, it, they excite in, in the vacuum. And uh, those phase differences are generated by this quantized impedance network. And, and so the particles decay where the nodes are, where the impedances are matched so that energy can be transformed between different particles, between different frequencies. We'll look at geometric and topological impedances, uh, which are scale dependent for the geometric and scale invariant for the topological and parametric impedances. We need uh, some sort of noiseless nonlinearity in the collapse of the wave function. This is essential in quantum mechanics and parametric, parametric impedances satisfy this requirement. Uh, the geometric representation of Clifford algebra we'll look at in more depth. Uh, uh, and then the wave function interactions and what we call the geometric scattering matrix, uh, physical manifestation in more depth, the electro electromagnetic S matrix, and the origin of inertial mass, and then some examples in particle physics, gravitation, and cosmology, uh, and we'll see the equivalence between inertial and gravitational mass. And then the next frontier, condensed matter, where we haven't really gone yet. We want to look at lattice impedances, uh, things like quantum computing. Uh, if you want a quantum computer, then at some point, uh, just like your, your classical computer's impedance matched, your, your quantum computer is going to have to be quantum impedance matched. So the history of, of impedance me measurements, uh, the classical impedance measurements, this is the best reference I know of for that. And it's, it's broken into four periods. The early experimenters starting in 1775, the first commercial instruments from 1900 to 1945. And this was important. You could buy stuff and put it together instead of having to make everything for yourself. <clears throat> then uh, electronics coming of age, basically the, the, the Second World War and the development of uh, telecommunications and radar uh, uh, drove drove the development of electronics, uh, and finally the digital era, uh, and uh, uh, this really changed things because uh, uh, as soon as you had the fast Fourier transform and all of these these signal processing uh, algorithms, it uh, and and to get the digital area, we really needed uh, the solid state. You can't you can't effectively move into the digital digital area with vacuum tubes. So these, uh, this, this particular curve just, uh, you know, Google gave it to me and, and I don't know how it got it to me, whether they've got AIs that are tracking what we're doing as we're online and they know we're interested, but I couldn't, I couldn't find the source of this. Uh, it was just an image that, that appeared. Uh, the interesting part of it here, what it, what it does is it looks at the, the fraction of documents that mention impedance. And I don't know how it selects the uh, the uh, subset of the world's documents that you, it uses to search for them, uh, but whatever that subset was, it, it it said that it first appeared back in the uh, 1820s, which makes sense because that's when Ohm's law was published in 1827, uh, and then it disappeared all the way up until the 1870s, and and my guess is that its reappearance was due to Maxwell's equations uh, stated a part in 10 to the minus 7 for, for a while and then started to take off. So we saw this exponential growth and in, in the appearance of uh, impedance in uh, engineering and scientific documentation. And then at, at the end of World War II, again, it plateaued a bit and, and the, the rate of growth uh, increased more slowly. And, and around the time that digital showed up, then it, 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 it took a dive here. So we, we lost this concept of impedance uh, for a variety of reasons. I think a big part of it was simply that things were being done in digital and most of the analog stuff related to impedance transformations uh, had already been figured out. So to define impedance, uh, 
if we say that the impedance matching governs the amplitude and phase of, of the information transmission, uh, but the impedance itself, uh, we start with rest mass. We start with something more simple than electromagnetics with one field instead of two. And all rest mass particles have mechanical impedance. Uh, mass is quantized in the particle spectrum. So that means that if we can get to the electro electromagnetic, which we can do with this simple conversion factor, the, the line charge density squared, then we've got the what governs the flow of energy in, in quantum electrodynamics, uh, we've got a model for it. <clears throat> so mechanically, this is Newton's, Newton's law here, force equals mass times acceleration, plus this dissipative term, uh, friction times the velocity, and then the uh, spring constant times the displacement. And the uh, mechanical impedance then is this force divided by the, the resulting change in velocity. So if you're pushing on something and it doesn't move, there's no velocity change and it's effectively an infinite impedance. On the other hand, if you, you wave a feather at it and it takes off, flies away, then, then you've got a very large velocity from a small force and it's a very small impedance. The units are kilograms per second, and this is the first place where the topological inversion shows up, because uh, if you think that there's more kilograms per second, it would mean that there, there's a, a lower impedance, uh, more flow, but it's a higher impedance. There's, there, there's uh, uh, less, less flow with more kilograms per second. Uh, and we'll get to this in more detail in a couple slides from now. Uh, so there's a similar second order differential equation in time uh, for uh, voltage, uh, uh, but uh, for potential, uh, but force is the gradient of, of potential. So it's, it's uh, a, a, a spatial gradient here that, that uh, makes them, they aren't really the same thing. Uh, and the, the impedance, the resulting uh, electromagnetic impedance, uh, from here you have uh, the inductance multiplied by the rate of change of the current or the second derivative of charge. And then this is Ohm's law, resistance times current and a charge divided by capacitance. Uh, and this, this omega L here is, is, is the, the amount of res reactants, uh, the uh, imaginary uh, form of resistance uh, and uh, this the j basically is a 90 degree uh, phase shift uh, so so what we see is the inductive impedances uh, uh, advance the phase and the reactive impedances uh, retard uh, the, the capacitive impedance re retard the phase and resistance doesn't do anything to the phase the units here the kilograms per seconds is, is the mechanical part and the meter squared per coulomb squared is the conversion factor between mechanical and electromagnetic. So examples of the trumpet, if you, uh, if you take away the trumpet and leave the mouthpiece, then, then your impedance mismatch to the room. Uh, you, you put it, uh, the, the trumpet back, the horn back, that, that, that uh, the flare of the horn matches the, the impedance to the room. And then you, you have, uh, uh, the, the player is, is able to get the energy uh, from his breath into the room. The, uh, the player, from the player's perspective, the, the trumpet blows easily when, when, when the horn is there, but the mouthpiece doesn't blow so easily. The impedance mismatch doesn't let the energy get away from the lips so easily. Uh, an electromechanical, a loudspeaker uh, is another example. Uh, and, and the cell phone is strictly an electromagnetic uh, uh, impedance matching problem. So the in phase space here, if we look at this in phase space, where this is the real part of the, the, uh, uh, the impedance and, and uh, these the reactants, the, the imaginary part of the impedances with the, the uh, uh, phase advance of inductance and the phase retarding of capacitance. Uh, <clears throat> these are conjugate variables in some sense. If, if we take the, the real part to be the energy, the amplitude of, of the wave function, and, and the uh, time part to be the phase, uh, uh, the phase of the wave function, when the wave function collapses, we, we lose the phase. There's no, no, no longer any oscillation for the phase to correspond to. 
and we get the amplitude. We get a lump of, of incoherent heat. So, uh, uh, and the, the, to keep in mind that the, 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 uh, there's this principle of phase-based conservation, Leo, Leoville's theorem. I think I've pronounced or spelled that correctly. Uh, coming back to impedance history, uh, and Oliver Heaviside, uh, he played a big role in, in this whole game, as you can see, just by the fact that he was the person that actually defined uh, all of the basic parameters that we use when we're dealing with with, uh, with electromagnetics, either in space or in, in uh, uh, condensed matter. Uh, <clears throat> and as important as this was, actually his most important, uh, his strongest influence as far as, as I'm concerned, was his role in this math war be uh, between Clifford algebra and, and vector algebra, his vector algebra, which uh, is the algebra of the engineer, whereas the Clifford algebra is more uh, the algebra of math and, 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 and physics. And vector algebra won back, back between Heaviside and Gibbs back in the, uh, at the turn between the 1800s and 1900s, the, the, uh, what was taught in schools. Uh, the main thing we were teaching was the vector algebra. <clears throat> So the, the impedance matching, I'm not going to look at in, in too much detail here other than, than um, uh, to refer you to this reference if you want something that's 13 pages that that's, uh, really covers in, in simple detail what's involved. Uh, it had this image in there in, in this uh, at this link that shows a, a conjugate match here where we're, we're – uh, when we conjugate, basically what it means is we just reverse the sign of the imaginary part. So if we start with the real source uh, and and uh, we want to match to something that has a phase shift, then we want to match the resistive part and uh, uh, flip the sign on the uh, on the imaginary part, the phase part. Uh, so this is what a matching net would, would, would network would look like. <clears throat> so, so now we want a photo, photon uh, impedance match to a single free electron. And, and uh, this thing looks something like this. If, if we start off with a photon entering from the right here, and, and there's an electron, the Compton wavelength is sitting over here. And when it gets uh, uh, within the inverse Rydberg, a distance that corresponds to the inverse Rydberg from the Compton wavelength, the, that electron, the... Uh, phase shifts of the electron impedances that they, they uh, uh, retard the electric component of uh, the the electric flux quantum of the photon uh, flux is quantized in the photon and uh, the magnetic uh, part uh, goes to low impedance the electric part goes to high impedance it's curious there's this first inversion they go in the wrong direction before they go in the right direction and uh, this is for a dipole impedance. If you go to higher order impedances uh, or lower order monopole impedances, uh, then they're the same in both the, the near field and the far field. But in this transition region, uh, the, the three pole and four pole impedances, and the quadrupole is important because we, we think about gravitational radiation. They diverge. They go to infinity at, at uh at the, at the Rydberg. And, and so that is, is potentially a problem when you think of, of gravitational radiation as, as quadrupole radiation, if you want to do quantum gravity. So anyhow, the, uh, this, this near field impedance of the photon uh, is, is not found in, in, in the education of the physicist. It's not something that if you try to, to to dig this out, you have to go into the electrical engineering, the antenna engineering, uh, and uh, to, to get it at the near field impedance of the photon. But in addition to the photon near field impedance, you need a corresponding uh, a quantized near field impedance for the electron, and that part got lost as well. So this, uh, this, uh, this was January 20, 2010, when, when, uh, uh, this, when, when I started to understand this 11 years ago, uh, and topological inversion, again, it, it plays a big part in this. If it, Basically, the topological inversion, instead of having the photon uh, 
come from larger scale, come from the, the right in an image like this. It ends up coming from the left, as it would, for instance, if you were thinking about the Big Bang. Um, <clears throat> and the, the last item here, what defines the mass scale here? Because basically all we have, we don't have a proton yet. We, 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 all we have is a photon and an electron. But it seems that, that despite that, the 13.6-point EV photon that's coming in will, uh, uh, without defining a proton, saying we're, that there's a hydrogen atom, but rather just an electron, in the basic property of the vacuum wave function, it, it gives us this impedance match to the Bohr radius at, at, the, uh, at the quantum hall. Uh, quantum Hall impedance and quantum Hall and centrifugal impedances are the same value. They're both 25, 8, 1, 12 ohms. And <clears throat> so, so the, uh, uh, this disassociation of the hydrogen atom uh, at uh, the impedance of quantum Hall, which is also uh, the impedance of the electron going around the proton at the Bohr radius in this classical, quasi-classical model of QED. Uh, is it seems to be a valid a valid approach. It seems to validate this idea of near field impedances and give an explanation for how uh, <clears throat> how a disassociation actually ha happens. How the the energy gets from the photon to the electron. So how the concept was lost in quantum mechanics. Um, there's this topological inversion that I mentioned that that the units are are inverted in the SI units. And, and Bjorken was looking at this, Feynman was looking at it. What Bjorken discovered uh, back in 1959 when he was uh, working with uh, um, dispersion relations was, was that uh, Feynman's regularization parameters of QED are the impedance mismatches of, 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 um, of, of QED. And when you include them, it renders QED finite. So this, uh, 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 Bajorkin thought it was going to be a powerful tool. Uh, if, if you look in uh, Bajorkin and Drell, the textbook, uh, which was what we learned quantum field theory from back in my generation, then uh, um, he discusses that uh, in section 18.4. Uh, but the point is that that he thought it was it was what, what he thought was resistance is actually conductance. So the intuitive advantage that that he and other people should have got, including myself, when I was looking at this back in in 1975, was was uh, you couldn't it didn't make any sense because even though you thought you understood what resistance was, it was really conductance. And to make the leap from there into particle physics uh, with that inversion was just a a little bit more than we could do. The origin of it comes from the strength of magnetic charge. If, if in the Dirac relation, uh, uh, which this is what caused uh, Dirac to uh, to uh, claim that if there there ex existed, uh, you know, he wrote his papers in the, in the in in the early 1930s and wrote a second one, I think, in the 40s. Uh, about magnetic charge and, and the existence of magnetic charge. And, and uh, so there's this thing here that the, the, the uh, interaction of an electric charge with a magnetic charge, this thing's called a dion, D-Y-O-N. And that was studied pretty intensively in the, the, in the later 1900s. Uh, but it, it provides us with, with the key to understanding what's, what's going on uh, in, in terms of uh, electric and magnetic charge symmetry and topological inversion. So magnetic charge, I think now it's commonly accepted that it's the topological dual of electric charge. And what that means is that, that uh, uh, if you substitute uh, h-bar over g for uh, the electric charge in at these fundamental lengths that we discussed on the previous slide, the Rydberg, the Bohr, the Compton, the classical, and over here we've got that Higgs line, the, the 10 jev bottomonium decay mode. If you substitute the uh, uh, magnetic charge for electric charge, then all of these characteristic, characteristic lengths are inverted. So, so the Bohr radius, since instead of being, being uh, 137 times larger than the Compton wavelength is 137 times less. 
the Compton wavelength doesn't have an le electric charge. It's just uh, H over MC. Uh, lambda is H over MC. So, so it doesn't change when you make the substitution. Um, <clears throat> But a consequence of this is that is that uh, magnetic charge can't radiate. It, 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 it's uh, instead of uh, the wavelength of the photon being 137 times longer than the Bohr radius, uh, which it is in the case of electric charge, it's going to be 137 times shorter. It's going to be trying to come out at, 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 at the Higgs, at, at the 10 jet bottom odium line. So... Uh, this this uh, this topological inversion uh, plays plays big in what follows. Um, so, in terms of Mach's principle, we get a handle a little bit of a handle on this because now what the inversion does is it 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 puts what would be the singularity inside of, of magnetic charge, uh, which is a pseudoscalar, it's not a say, scalar, it doesn't really have that singularity there, it puts it at infinity. So when you look at Mach's principle, then, then uh, you're beginning to address this, this topological inversion. And uh, in 1975 then is where, oh, did we, I think this is the first time we've looked at this slide, so we should. <coughs> Is that true? Is this the first time? Yeah, it is. Okay. So the uh, here's the the four those four ages that that uh, uh, that we looked at earlier in terms of the history. Uh, with in here in in the yellow, we're looking at uh, when quantum theory started looking at quantum impedances. And in the, the gold is when experiment, when people could actually start doing experiment with quantum impedances. And then the green is this, this uh, it says beyond standard model, but it's actually inside a standard model, just uh, concealed. Uh, uh, the the two-body problem and later uh, the electron impedances. But the Mach's principle part of it, if, if we start with a mechanical analog of the Dirac equation, so instead of a electron and positron spinners, we've got these two eccentric weights and they're, they're counter-rotating uh, so that they, they pull together going down and they pull opposite uh, horizontally and then vertically they're pulling together. And this thing is transforming 2D rotation to 1D translations. And they're an analog of the uh, uh, electron and positron spinners of the Dirac equation. So this gives us this, this simple shortcut looking at the mechanical impedances to calculate the electromagnetic impedances. And this is the, the paper that followed from designing, building, and operating uh, these, these types of machines. We, we did the mechanical design and then, and then we put the circuits together with the inductors and capacitors and ran it on the test bench. I'm not sure how much we learned from doing that, but we, uh, we did it and got that part of the idea in our minds. And then it, it sat for uh, for quite a while. But the idea here, again, is the background independence. You have to have a background independent model. And uh, th so this is an analysis of the two-body problem that, that says you can really give a strong a strong argument against any anything that uh, imposes an independent reference frame in terms of the form of the equations that develop. And uh, when you do it uh, in a logically rigorous manner, you get uh, uh, mechanical impedances coming out. So this was, was submitted to the American Journal of Physics back in 75. Ed Taylor was uh, the editor-in-chief, and he was very helpful, really promoted this for us, and uh, referred me to uh, Mary Ellen Cox, a professor over at University of Michigan in Flint, Michigan, and she helped me uh, clean clean it up a bit and add some references. And uh, it was submitted, but the referee said there's no new physics, so it, it didn't get published. It did uh, uh, get published as a, uh, an appendix to the electron impedances paper. Uh, so, so the the model that we get it 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 has the correct amplitude and some phase information, but again. We don't have all the information that we need to, to apply Maxwell's equations because uh, we only have a single field in the mechanical model, not two. Uh, but the, 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 the expectation is that you can actually uh, run eight Maxwell's equations on the full eight components of the wave function, uh, their interactions. 
So this is a mechanical impedance time derivatives. It's, it's the rate of change of impedance as a function of scale or a function of energy. This is something from a 1982 notebook where I, I still didn't know that what I was dealing with was impedances here. And this is uh, uh, the matrix, the different forces, gravitational, inertial, uh, and the different forces interacting with each other, the couplings between the different forces and the resulting uh, either impedance derivatives or impedances. And some of these have a nice simple form uh, for, for the impedances. Uh, uh, this is vector Lorentz impedance, for instance, the electric field, electric charge in the magnetic field. Um, <clears throat> but this really didn't uh, come to fruition until uh, basically until uh, the physics of musical instruments. My son's a musician, and, and we've got music spaces in the house, and in, in trying to understand a little bit better the acoustics of these spaces, uh, it finally, uh, the understanding that uh, acoustic impedances are, are mechanical impedances, and the units are kilograms per second. Uh, that's what permitted to, to uh, understand the impedances of the electron, how to, how to, how to uh, uh, solve that problem. And this is what the impedance network looked like. This is from that, that uh, uh, 2011, April 2011 paper. So we had a little over a year from, <coughs> from looking at uh, the photon impedance match to the electron to uh, actually understanding the electron impedances. Out here we see the, uh, the dipole impedance that was missing uh, from, from uh, the Redberg to the Bohr. And there's no impedance match uh, at, at, uh, to the photon at the Bohr radius in, in this impedance network, which at least in part my, may explain the, the stability of atomic matter. <coughs> so we've got... Uh, uh, the uh, the vector Lorentz impedances, the scale invariant impedances, uh, a, a variety of them here, all ex spaced by a power of uh, two alpha, uh, where the factor of two comes from, uh, I still don't know. There's factors of two and, and a factor of three, and maybe even a factor of pi that floats around in the model, uh, because it, it, so, for instance, uh, Thomas precession and the transformation from uh, our rest frame to the rotating frame uh, that explains the factor of two in the Thomas precession. If, if you look at it in terms of Mach's principle, to pin down where that factor of two belongs in this impedance network uh, is not something I've been able to do yet. But anyhow, this is the network we got and presented in, in this paper in 2011. Uh, it starts to become more meaningful to us if we look at it in terms of the unstable particle spectrum, which was a little over a year later uh, when that connection finally solidified itself. So here we see the, uh, the uh, lifetimes of the unstable particles. Uh, here out here's the neutron lifetime uh, or the coherence length you might consider to be the lifetime times the speed of light. <clears throat> and the muon lifetime, the uh, pion and the neutral kaons, and, and uh, or not all the, the neutral kaons split between the two, the short and the long. Charm, beauty, and strangeness. Uh, and and uh, all the way over here to the, uh, the dominant decay mode, the tangibonimonium decay mode of the super heavies. So the, the decays are structured in powers of the fine structure constant uh, because the, uh, the uh, impedances are structured in powers of the fine structure constant. And uh, particles most easily decay at the nodes in the impedance network because that's where impedances are matched, so the energy can flow. Uh, the particle lifetimes, this, this was uh, uh, Malcolm McGregor. Uh, uh, and it, the fact that they're structured in powers of the fine structure constant is, is something that the physicist typically doesn't realize uh, because it, it has implications about uh, the nature of, of the nuclear forces that, that uh, um, are 
perhaps in conflict with the standard model, with the origin of those forces in the standard model. So Malcolm really wasn't able to publish. The, uh, the mainstream consensus tends to uh, ideas that are different. It's much more difficult to get them into the literature. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is the, the oscillation between fermion and boson lines that, that, uh, that uh, you see mostly bosons here, fermion here, fermion here, fermion here with, with a boson mixed in. You've got some strangeness that shows up there. Then the beauty, uh, the bottom, the bottom, bottom, bottom uh, quarks uh, show up on a boson line. Then we get this mixture here, this what I would call electroweak interference of some sort uh, before we get over here to, to uh, uh, the electromagnetic decays. And then things get messy here, and then we get the dual resonances over here before we finally get to. So anyhow, the point is that you need impedance matching, that it governs the unstable particle lifetimes. The, the phase shifts due to these quantum impedances cause the various components of, of the wave. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, I lost connection. Actually, some kids are playing outside. They have shorted something, and my power went away. So sorry. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, you can continue from here. Yeah, right. Do I continue from here? Yeah. Uh, could you just go back one slide just to cross check? Sure. Sure. To here? Yes, yes. This is where I lost connection. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, please. Okay, I can see Yes, sir. Can, can you tell me my am I on camera here? Uh, sorry, are you? Yeah, when when the when the video plays, will the viewers be able to see me? No. Yes, yes, they're seeing you. They're seeing me. They're good, seeing sir. you. Hand gestures, hand gestures are good then. Good. Yeah, yeah. I will uh, I will slightly you know uh, edit the video and again resend it to you so that you can cross check. Then I will play it. Okay. Okay, yeah, we can see you, sir. We can see you in the video. We are seeing you on the right side of the video, and on the left side, we are seeing the content. Okay, good. So, right. so continue with. Please, please, uh, sir. I think uh, we we lost you when you started talking about this. Uh, um, you know uh, how this comes back in particles. Initially, you were saying that uh, we do not know why this two alpha, three alpha, or sometimes pi alpha comes and uh, Thomas precision you are mentioning, and then the power went. Uh, so maybe you could con continue from there. Right. Okay, I'm going, I'm going back. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. No problem, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we're, we're gonna look at the, uh, the unstable particle spectrum uh, and how the nodes of the quantum impedance network govern the unstable particle lifetimes. Uh, this was uh, a little over a year from the previous paper on the electron impedances uh, when we were able to connect the network with the lifetimes. So the, the, uh, here we see uh, the unstable particle lifetimes are actually their coherence lengths, the lifetimes multiplied by the speed of light. The neutron out here, uh, uh, the muon, uh, the bosons here, the pion and, and kaons, uh, the charm, beauty, and strangeness. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the point here is that that, uh, that uh, the decays, where the particles decay, uh, is, is where the impedances are matched. That's where energy can flow so that, that uh, uh, for instance, a pion can uh, uh, change from, uh, change into two photons. The, uh, the, Alternation here between fermion and boson as, as we look at the decays, the clustering of the decays, I think can be attributed to the fact that, that we have to get rid of spin one half. We have to get rid of a neutrino for the weak decays. So for that neutrino to manifest is, is not so simple and, and that accounts uh, for the, the long, uh, the long de decay times of the, of the weak decays. Uh, there's no impedance match at the at the Bohr radius, uh, which is interesting uh, to to the photon, which I think 
perhaps in part might account for uh, the stability of atomic atomic matter. <clears throat> the the uh, Malcolm McGregor did a lot of work on unstable particle lifetimes and also on this 70, 70 MeV platform state, what he calls the platform state, which we'll discuss further later on. <clears throat> uh, and, but in, in it, the, the implication of this is that, is that uh, electromagnetism, QED, is somehow involved in areas here that we normally think of as, as being uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear forces. <clears throat> either weak or strong forces. And so he was really never able to publish. Uh, interesting, interestingly, how, how strong, strongly the community resists ideas that, that don't, uh, don't uh, fit comfortably with the, the standard, standard consensus. The, uh, so we're going to look at uh, geometric and topological impedances and parametric impedances. The geometric impedances are the impedances of gravitational or Coulomb interactions, the monopole interaction of two monopoles, dipole impedances, scalar Lorentz, the potentials of one over R and one over R cubed. They're, they're scale dependent. Uh, they communicate amplitude and phase. They can do work. Uh, the resultant motion is parallel to the uh, applied force. They can be shielded. And in uh, uh, gauge theory gravity, uh, they're translation gauge fields. Actually, in any, in any gauge, uh, gauge model, uh, these are the translation fields. <clears throat> the topological impedances... Uh, which include the vector Lorenz impedance of quantum Hall and the uh, heronoff bohm effect, the centrifugal impedance and, and three-body impedances. So when we, we think about three-body interactions, uh, for instance, in the neutrino or with quarks, then, then uh, uh, this topological impedance has to be given consideration. <clears throat> they're one over R squared potentials, they're scale invariant. They... They're not single me measurement observables. And this is important, this distinction of single measurement observables when one's looking at quantum logic. They communicate phase only. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, they can't do work. The resultant motion is perpendicular to the applied force. So the gyroscope comes to mind, for instance. Uh, they can't be shielded. Uh, as the heronoff bomb effect has taught us, they're associated with the rotation gauge fields and, and anomalies in, uh, in quantum mechanics. And, and they're the channel of non-local entanglement because what's entangled in non-local entanglement is just the phase. Uh, so the use of the term gauge, uh, this is real unfortunate because really all it is is phase. Uh, and it goes all the way back, to, I guess, to Whale and his early models where he was trying to do a five-dimensional uh, model that included both electromagnetism and gravity and that uh, dealt with the scale of space. And actually it's, it's, it's the phase shifts, which in some sense are, are related to the scale of phase, but it's the phase coherence that defines the boundary of a wave function. So anytime I, I, I see people or read about people talking about gauge theories, I just think about quantum phase or, or phases in general. The impedances shift the phases. They're, they're the, an alternative to the covariant derivative. <clears throat> the parametric impedances, quantum mechanics needs this nonlinear process for energy transformation in the frequency domain. Uh, and, and Clifford algebra accomplishes this via multiplication, the geometric product. Uh, and the scale-dependent uh, geometric impedances uh, if, if you think of a, a variable capacitor, what we call a veractor, uh, 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 when you apply a voltage to it, it changes the capacitance. Uh, and and uh, so variable or a variable inductance. Uh, so that's the parameter that's being varied. And because uh, this, the, the scale dependent impedances, uh, as the energy seeks to escape, from, from the wave function, the, the Compton wavelength, the de Broglie or the, the Planck length, whatever whatever scale the, the fields are confined to by the mismatches when, when the energy tries to escape, 
well, it, it's experiencing a, a varying impedance at that time. So you have you have this uh, parametric property happening as, as the wave function is oscillating. And uh, uh, parametric amplification and para parametric energy conversion happens at, at twice the frequency of the, the, uh, uh, the basic frequency of the oscillator. So if we look at fermions and bosons, if we look at, at, at something that, that spins twice for something else that only spins once, uh, then, then, uh, uh, then we have a pump. The, uh, the the boson's the pump and the fermion is is the oscillator, and uh, so this this uh, is how the actual parametric process is applied to the capacitance. I uh, I think or this provides a mechanism. The topological impedances they can't do work, but they they still can function in how the wave function behaves by being phase shifters. So so mode couplers, for instance. Uh, and and there's this more subtle thing about gravitation and how how uh, the topological impedances uh, play in gravitation that that uh, we'll be looking at a little later on. <clears throat> so the geometric representation coming back to that again and and our uh, our three assumptions here about about the geometry. Uh, the Clifford algebra is a division algebra. So what defines an algebra? Basically, we want these four basic operations, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And this is what Hamilton was looking for with the quaternions. He wanted uh, uh, an invertible algebra. He wanted something that he could divide in. And, and uh, he ended up having to go to the quaternion to have three phases uh, to be able to divide. So it's essential for invertibility. So if you want topology, if you want to deal with singularities, with dark, mat dark matter, with topological duality and, and string theory, uh, and also how that relates to S-duality and string theory. So there's four normed division algebra. The norm means there's a zero in, in the algebra and, and also that it has to be placed in, in some particular location. Uh, which I th we take to be the origin uh, of one or the other of the two objects, the wave functions that are interacting, or both of them. So anyhow, there's four four norm division algebras. The reals, uh, one-dimensional, one degree of freedom, the complex two, the quaternion four, and the octonion eight. And there's a theorem, the Hurwitz theorem, that says that, that that's the largest possible division algebra. So that's uh, so our wave function is both minimally uh, in the sense that it has the eight objects needed to completely define uh, the algebra and maximally in the sense that there's no bigger algebra. Our, wave, our vacuum wave function is both minimally and maximally complete. So these are the Clifford algebras more familiar in the Dirac and Pauli representations. And they're the, the natural vacuum wave function. We complain that we... we, we we uh, we uh, assert that this is the, uh, the the most natural representation we can get for quantum mechanics, and it's the same at all scales. So Hessianus, this book right here was the book that that opened the window for me into geometric algebra, uh, and uh, in 1966. Uh, uh, presented presented. Uh, uh, space-time algebra and the 2015 he uh, he uh, was a second edition and in between this 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 text here by the Cambridge people uh, is certainly the the recommended the recommended book the uh, contents of space-time algebra are here Heston has posted them on this page and and, and you can read it for free so the consensus among the community is that the geometric algebra is the universal language for mathematical physics. Uh, Hestinus shows this organization graphically here, and basically these are the things that, that he claims are all tied together in geometric algebra. The American Association of Physics Teachers uh, presented the 2002 Ersted Medal to Hestinus for reforming the mathematical language of physics. And this shows the operation of the, the algebra. If, if, if we, uh, for instance, if we take uh, two vectors, as I mentioned earlier, two vectors uh, and take the product, then, then, then uh, 
what comes out is is a, a gray zero scalar boson and a gray two uh, bivector fermion. The bivectors are spin one half, and the trivectors are spin one. These guys are tautological, and, and these guys are are uh, strictly geometric. And here we see how the the we have this grade increasing, dimension increasing, and dimension decreasing property. So this is dynamic supersymmetry in the sense that that uh, that taking these products, changing these dimensionalities, converts fermions to bosons and bosons to fermions. So taken together, these the four super heavies, uh, these guys here comprise a minimally complete 2D Clifford algebra. The sum mode of the, the Z and the W is the top within a, a percent or so. And the difference is uh, uh, bottomonium, the, the dominant decay mode. And so it seems a little interesting to me that, that the Higgs doesn't show up in these sum and difference modes, but I don't know if that's of any, any consequence or not. So the geometric scattering matrix looks like this. We multiply two scalars together, we get a scalar. We multiply a scalar by any of these and we get the same thing. The scalars can't change dimensionality because they don't have dimensionality. Uh, but it gets more interesting here as, as we multiply these higher dimensional objects together. So the, the blue background, uh, we claim these are the eigenmodes, the, 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 the uh, even dimensional modes. And, and the, the yellow background uh, are the transition modes. So, so the possibility is that we can connect these with, with the two flavor SUEs, SU3s, and, and, and this with the color SU3. And similarly, the SU2s of the weak interaction. <clears throat> So we were lucky with this. The, the, this 28, the, the 2011 paper, the electron impedances paper, uh, we, uh, from an engineer's point of view, we tried to pick out a, a model that was maximally symmetric electrically and magnetically. Um, and it turned out to look like this. It had eight components. And this was a serendipity. We were lucky because it turned out that in 2015, uh, uh, looking at gauge theory of gravity, we we discovered that that what we had picked up was the, the the geometric algebra octonian. We had this equivalence with with uh, general relativity that had been discovered by Hessenus and the Cambridge group in the 1990s, and has been written about fairly extensively since. So this, this was uh, presented to the 2015 Barcelona Conference on Applications of Geometric Algebra. Um, and, and so we claim that, that there's a, a, a model of quantum gravity here. The physical manifestation of, of the model, uh, by introducing the coupling constant, then we can define these, these, these different... Uh, uh, these these different flux quanta, uh, an electric charge quanta, a magnetic charge quanta, uh, and, and the units that they're in here, the Bohr magneton, uh, which interesting would look like an electric dipole moment, except we've we've thrown this this factor of two, the factor of the speed of light in. Uh, here's here's an electric dipole moment that lacks a factor of speed of light, and we've got this fl factor of two floating around here. So anyhow, this this uh, lets us uh, physically manifest, and then we can calculate the energies. The energy basically uh, these modes here, uh, when you confine these fields to to the Compton wavelength of the electron, <coughs> they have uh, uh, they define the rest mass of the electron. When you define these modes to the Compton wavelength of the electron. Uh, they have 70 MeV instead of 0.511 MeV. So this is McGregor's platform state. We can we can excite the electron, but but if we excite it hard enough, we start getting this stuff up at 70 MeV. <clears throat> and again, there's this factor of two floating around. Uh, but if you take it at uh, that that actually 35 MeV is where where th things start to become relevant, then then. Three times 35 MeV is the, the 105 MeV muon. Four times uh, uh, 35 MeV is the 140 MeV uh, pion. So, so you get the muon and the pion mass right away. 
Uh, and those are accurate at the level of anywhere from 1% to a couple parts in a thousand for the pion. And, <clears throat> and from there, we go to what's called topological mass generation, how these excitations can, can uh, generate, for instance, the mass of the proton. On the other hand, if uh, some of the modes have less energy at, uh, at uh, uh, when they're confined to the Compton wavelength of the electron, they have energies that correspond to the, the Bohr radius. And here we've got not only this factor of two uh, that between 0.511 MeV and 1.02, but also another factor of two. So, so this 14 MeV that we show here is actually four times uh, the 3.7 the 14 keV is actually three times the 3.7 keV. So, so we've got an origin of inertial mass here that, that uh, is, is the, the uh, energy of, of the flux quanta, the field quanta when confined to a given scale. And this is true if you go down to the Planck length, then, then the Planck mass is, is, uh, is, is, uh, just these flux quanta confined now to the, the Planck scale instead of the Compton wavelength of the electron. <clears throat> so this, this is our scattering matrix. Now where we've gone ahead and assigned these electric and magnetic flux quanta to the, the eight wave function components. The Dirac wave function is the electric charge and the magnetic moments. So these, these are the, the modes of the Dirac wave function and, and <clears throat> the, uh, this mode here is where most of the mass sits. This, and, and this mode here is, is, is 137 times less amount of mass. So, so uh, the, the, the magnetic interaction of, of, of these two dipoles, the, the coupling strength <coughs> of spin up to spin down. Is, is uh, uh, the origin of the mass of the electron in this model. These, uh, <clears throat> these modes that have the, uh, the symbols are, are what are plotted on, uh, on, uh, on this plot. So now we're, now we're going to the examples. Uh, we've seen the origin of the inertial mass. We're going to the examples. And to emphasize here that, that the model we're looking at here, the QED model, it's, it's two-body. And we claim this is fundamental. Now we're at, we're at the, the vacuum wave function level is manifested by the coupling constant. Special relativity is three-body. The Lorentz transform is, is just the Pythagorean theorem, <clears throat> uh, the triangle. So special relativity is emergent, but somehow... Uh, it's already built into that the relativistic aspect is built into this at the two body level. And if that wasn't true, then we wouldn't see this correlation between the two body modes and the unstable particle lifetime. So, so the, uh, if, if instead of matching, uh, to, uh, to the Compton wavelength, if we look at the match, uh, to, to the Planck length, and here we see the Compton wavelength, and, and here we see the Planck length, and we have the same characteristic uh, characteristic lengths. <clears throat> but now, now we're looking at, at the the uh, so the first the first thing to emphasize here is that the impedance mismatch from here to here. Uh, if, if if the Planck particle tries to radiate the Hawking photon, then right away it encounters impedance mismatches. <clears throat> and, and those impedance mismatches, when you look at the, at, at the value of them, no, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not accustomed to talking so much. My voice hasn't, hasn't been exercised so much. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for troubling you. Uh, this this particular graph looks so beautiful and symmetric, actually. It's, uh, yes, yes, it is. it is. Yes, it is. Mm. And somehow I think uh, you know the truth always lies in simplicity and in symmetry. So, <laughs> mm. Okay. Um. 
So yeah. I should continue. You can. Yeah, whenever you're ready, sir. No, no hurry. Please take a break, yep. and then we can. <laughs> no, I'm ready. I can yeah. continue. I'm almost, done. Okay. almost done. Almost yeah. done. Please. So the. Uh, so here we have the Planck length and the Compton wavelength. If we if we look at a, a primordial photon, then then the first thing it encounters is, is this this Higgs mode here. Uh, the top and the Higgs, it, it sees the, the top first, that's the heaviest heaviest thing. And that, that's spin one half. So the first thing we do is we, we break chiral symmetry. We say that we, if, if the photon just has one, one state, if it's either electric field leads magnetic field or magnetic leads electric, then the photon's either left-handed or right-handed. And it's going to excite either a left-handed or right-handed uh, a top quark. And, and so we've broken chiral symmetry here. Then we get to the Higgs. And the Higgs then is supposedly uh, being that scalar boson. And that's, that's what's going to permit the energy to flow into the rest of the impedance network. So when we think of the Higgs as the origin of mass, it, I think it is in that sense in this model, but but when you want to do the calculations, you have to do the calculations not at the bottom odium line, but at, at the Planck length or the Compton wavelength, and and <clears throat> there it uh, it appears to behave a bit differently. So the primordial photon, the the impedance mismatch is such such that. Uh, the amount of energy that's left in the photon is most of it gets reflected back by these impedance mismatches is, is precisely the rest mass of the electron. Uh, so this is the origin of, of gravitational match, mass, is, is the impedance mismatch to the event horizon at the Planck length. <clears throat> Uh, that that provides an amount of energy that's equivalent to the field energy due to the the flux quanta that are confined at the Compton scale. Uh, here at ten to the minus thirty seconds, now we have this this sort of bifurcation. We have a very high impedance nodes and we have very low impedance nodes. And uh, 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 <clears throat> in models of inflation, this is about where inflation ends in the in the, in the more simple and early models. And uh, the, it would we would argue that that uh, as the the scale of space is established, it it actually uh, requires both of these to establish the scale of space, not not just the Planck length to establish it. <clears throat> in in the original model, we we said we're going to use the Compton wavelength to to establish the scale of space, but but uh, when we threw in the gravitational constant, then we were able to. Uh, calculate a Planck length. And then when we tried to, to understand the relation between the Planck and the Compton wavelengths, the energy, then we had to look at the ratio of, of, uh, of two ratios and the gravitational constant canceled out uh, the big G. And what we were left with was this length here, the, the Mach length and the impedances. So <clears throat> how, how the model bootstraps itself uh, Einstein used to talk about the strength of equation systems and how, how uh, uh, and this is discussed somewhat in, in uh, uh, the naturalist paper uh, in, in some, some of the early, earlier papers on this. But <clears throat> here we, it's the or origin of a, a gravitational mass, chirality, uh, the bar baryon asymmetry would arise from this as well. <clears throat> If we go to the other extreme and we, we look at, at the radius of the observable universe, uh, and, and we here again we're looking at the Hawking photon, and this is the mass gap, and what you could call the mass gap in the sense that <clears throat> first you have to consider the, the mismatched attenuated Hawking photon. I think you have to consider the full eight component wave function of the Planck particle uh, and how the whole thing is coupling uh, into into the impedance network that it excites from the vacuum wave function. But the amount of energy that's in, if you scale this to the amount of energy that remains in the wave function as it, it keeps being reflected back into uh, the Planck length, into the uh, event horizon, <clears throat> then the first thing you see is this quarter wave resonator here where 
if you start with the electric field as a, as a maximum and you, you say it's, it's repulsive, then, then you have the inflation happening and then where electric and magnetic, uh, the energy is equally present between the two fields is where inflation stops. And then you have this quarter, quarter wave resonator at the, uh, at the Compton wavelength where with the energy in the magnetic field that, that cord could correspond to the spin one half energy of uh, the magnetic moment that comprises the, the energy of the electron, the rest mass of the electron. We continue on and, and we'd say, okay, gravitation is attractive here. And then when we, we get out beyond the radius of the observable universe, it becomes repulsive again. And we've got this, this spin thing going on here, this rotation uh, gauge field that's present in all of it as well. <clears throat> so how this behaves in detail, uh, is, is something that remains to be investigated. Uh, certainly it's interesting if we say we want to look at, at the axion, some of the axion models are 10 to the minus 5 EV. And uh, uh, there we have, again, this bifurcation. It seems like we'd want to look uh, not at the impedances that we're looking at now, uh, but rather, in other words, Compton or de Broglie. Uh, I don't think I mentioned here, but I think it's important to consider the de Broglie wavelength is just the Doppler shift at Compton wavelength. Uh, if if there's no relative velocity, then 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 uh, then the de Broglie wavelength is infinite. And as is there's relative velocity, then then uh, the, the the Doppler frequency, uh, uh, the difference, the, the Doppler shift is is the actual frequency of the de Broglie wavelength. <clears throat> so. What that suggests is the impedance structure that we see at the, at the Compton wavelength is going to be replicated at, at, the, at the de Broglie wavelength, or at least part of that impedance structure. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of gravitational waves and, uh, and, and LIGO, uh, certainly uh, if, if we just go back to this for just a second, this might be worth looking at if I can find it. Yes, here. <coughs> the um, the uh, LIGO considers the impedance, the mechanical impedance. The LIGO, they, they try to uh, impedance mismatch the detectors. But the gravitational impedance um, they use is this huge number. And, and the reality is that if we want to think about things like <coughs> like storage wave uh, gravitational, storage wave gravitational waves, we have to think at, at different impedances, doing different impedance mismatching. So anyhow, um, you can calculate branching ratios. I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll provide. Uh, there's a link here to how you do this for the pi zero, the eta, and the eta prime. The, this is the calculation for the eta and the eta prime. And you can see the, the model agrees quite well with, uh, with uh, the experimentally, experimentally measured data. And then again, the calculation is in powers of alpha, the electromagnetic fine structure constant. So finally, condensed matter. Uh, the next frontier, the lattice impedances. Ah, uh, good, here it is. The de Broglie frequency is the Doppler shift of Compton. So in condensed matter, we I think we want to match the de Broglie. So questions, how do we how do we calculate lattice impedances? Feynman and Hibbs in their path integral book, they, they mention matching in 1D. So if we start with the hydrogen atom, so now we have to consider not just the, the photon and, and the electron, but the proton and the electron. And then molecular hydrogen. Um, so the question then is, what do we use for the proton wave function in this model? And, and we're going to want spin in this, of course. And, and then the carbon nanowire. Uh, the graphene diamond as we go from one dimension to two to three. 
So, so it seems like a non-trivial task already if, if we just try to go from the two-body interactions to the three-component neutrino. Um, the algebra is fertile. If we, we want to understand the, the chiral symmetry breaking in the left-handed uh, universe in terms of the neutrino, then the three-component associativity, the octonian algebra, <clears throat> the full octonian algebra is not a true algebra because it's, it's not associative. As soon as you get to the three components, it's order dependent, and and so uh, this this breaks uh, chiral symmetry, and it's it's why in the algebra, we can only have the left-handed universe if we want the octonian algebra to be a true algebra. <clears throat> now, so already just by going to, to three components, uh, from two body to three body, we've we've uh, complicated things. We want to go to n n body. <clears throat> <clears throat> so impedance matching is absolutely essential in computers as we know them. And the question is, uh, do we need a quantum impedance matching, quantum computing? I think the answer is yes, and, and to, to what extent this is being uh, paid attention to in, in the quantum com computing community, I don't know. If they're paying attention, they're not telling their competitors about it, is what I see. <clears throat> so the, the, the decoherence in quantum computing is, is the primary uh, decoherence is the stochastic uh, thermal background. So if we could uh, close a phase loop in the wave function, if we, if we look at a low energy mode and lock and track on it without actually uh, doing something in weak measurement theory so that we don't actually collapse the wave function, uh, <clears throat> then the question is, uh, you know, what can we do? How can we manipulate the wave function? And this is being done already. Uh, I can provide some references, which I will in the uh, copy of, of the uh, this presentation that I upload. Um, but the last question is, is what does this quantum network analyzer look like? Does the network analyzer itself have to be a phase coherent, a quantum, a quantum object? And I think that's all I want to try to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think it has been a lot of uh, effort. <laughs> yeah, Wonderful, I'm really, actually. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I have, I have I have nerve damage. I had I was given a medication. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The nerves that control with coffee and mucus. And, oh, and so the that all the feedback loops to regulate that are, are, are damaged and when I get stressed then I start to cough and <clears throat> so, so I actually have neurological a neurological problem that, that uh, makes it very difficult for me to uh, to talk as soon as I experience any stress. It's mm -hmm. wonderful it, work sir. Very happy yes, to hear from the hot spot. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very interesting. Uh, can I stop sharing here now? Yes, yes. I'd like to see your face again to be able to check if I can. <laughs> I close this. Yeah, yeah. good. So, so yeah. what happened? What happened is I had a medical problem. I was given a, a powerful antiviral, and mm. it attacked the nerves of of the exocrine system, what controls swallowing and mucus generation and vomiting. So I, I couldn't keep food. I couldn't eat for 19 days. And oh my God. Pain. Yes, it was terrible. I had to finally mm. just sit and sit and sit and meditate on controlling the vomiting I could I could begin to have food again. So but the medicine, the medicine I was given damaged those nerves. So as soon as I have something that's difficult, then it's start to make mucus and start to cough. Okay. So I apologize for that. And my body is a little bit damaged now. No, no, sorry. We should apologize to you 